Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named K Project Gyeongsong Creature. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins in 1945, as the Japanese army, having suffered a million casualties in the Pacific War, sought to consolidate their strength. They issued an immediate withdrawal order to the Japanese troops stationed in Korea. But before their retreat to Japan, they aimed to destroy all evidence of their aggression. Colonel Kato, deeply anguished, had developed a virus serum that promised to be a potent biological weapon, but he was compelled to follow orders. He first commanded the execution of the experimental subjects in captivity, then attempted to erase the traces of their crimes with fire. Amidst the flames, a colossal creature broke through the iron door, wreaking havoc with its goose roar. As March drew to a close, the Korean capital of Gyeongseong was brimming with the spirit of spring. People enjoyed the warm sunshine, celebrating the Tokyo air raids, and silently hoping for Japan's complete downfall. Yet, the night is always darkest just before dawn, and the Japanese lashed out viciously at the Korean people. Ordinary civilians were frequently beaten and humiliated, while patriotic martyrs suffered persecution. In these chaotic times, there were those who sought only self-preservation, like the city's wealthy businessman, Sang, who is the owner of a pawn shop, thriving by associating with Japanese elites. But even a person of his stature could be arbitrarily detained by the Japanese. Police chief Ishikawa first brutally assaulted him, then produced a photograph, demanding that he locate a missing woman pictured. Ishikawa sought Sang's assistance due to his extensive connections, known as the go-to for all matters in capital city. Sang immediately recognized the woman in the photo as Myongja, the top courtesan of a brothel, and also Ishikawa's mistress. Not wanting to offend the police chief's wife, he was about to refuse when Ishikawa threatened him viciously, stating that if he couldn't find Myongja before the cherry blossoms withered, Sang would meet a fate worse than death. With no other choice, Sang returned to the pawn shop to strategize with his associates. The errand boy is still young and lacks ideas of his own. The housekeeper is too impulsive. Only the maid is analyzing the current situation with a calm and collected mind. After some discussion, Sang decides to split up their tasks. The maid discreetly pawns off valuables to prepare for a quick getaway, while Sang himself does his best to track down Myong Ja. Unbeknownst to him, Myong Ja, who is pregnant, is being held at a secret Japanese military base. A girl beside her is dragged out of the cell, begging and breaking down in tears. However, another woman, Mal, remains eerily calm and cooperates with the Japanese soldiers, leaving with them. The two women are each locked in solitary cells with a plate of rice cakes placed in front of them. Starving, they don't hesitate to scarf them down. In a moment of choking, they gulp down the water beside them, which Colonel Cato watches with a sinister smile, knowing it's laced with the biochemical serum. Soon after, the girl suffers a splitting headache and violently smashes her head, while Mal can't stop vomiting as a worm-like creature wriggles inside her. Meanwhile, the maid is selling items to an old client who tells her about a skilled spy who can find anyone, dead or alive, digging three feet into the ground if necessary. Coincidentally, one of his relatives knows the spy, which might lead to finding the missing woman, Myong Ja. Elsewhere, Ishikawa has a driver secretly watch Sang, but he's clumsy and too obvious. Sang easily slips away from the dim-witted driver through the back door of a restaurant. Unexpectedly, there's another follower, a woman, judging by the footsteps. Sang strikes decisively but is disarmed by the woman with ease. She's agile with her skinny muscles, and Sang's chicken strength is no match for her. Fortunately for him, she doesn't aim to kill, and he takes advantage of a momentary lapse to knock off her hat. Upon closer inspection, Sang sees she's pretty sexy, with hair that shines under the moonlight and eyes that could captivate any soul and hormones. The woman named Yoon says she's looking for a certain Japanese painter and has heard of Sang's fame as the man who knows everything in the capital city, hoping he can help. Sang, noticing her worn clothes, assumes she can't afford to pay and decisively refuses. She earnestly tells Sang that she's actually searching for her missing mother, who vanished ten years ago, and perhaps only the painter knows her whereabouts. To her shock, Sang coldly suggests that her mother might have run off with the painter. Enraged, she trembles, slaps Sang hard, calling him vile and shameless, and then turns to leave resolutely. Back at his pawn shop, Sang met Yoon again, and the man sitting beside her is her father. It turns out the father and daughter duo are the secret agents the maid found. The situation turned in an instant, and it was Sang who was now asking Yoon for help in finding Myongja. In exchange, he also vowed to do his utmost to locate the painter. 
An official partnership was established between the two parties, with the deadline set before the cherry blossoms withered, because that was the day Sang was fated to die. Coincidentally, the painter was also at that secret experimental base at the time. He was the painter brought in by Cato to document the experimental results. As usual, the cage was spattered with blood, and the sight of twisted and mangled human bodies was startling. Suddenly, a monster sprang out, causing the painter to collapse to the ground in terror. But his expression quickly changed from horror to sadness when he recognized the necklace on the monster. The painter's thoughts drifted back to a year ago when he was destitute and had traveled across the sea to the Ong Siong Hospital in Korea, seeking employment to support his family. He never expected that on his first day, he would witness the heinous act of a live dissection. The Japanese army rarely used cameras to record their acts because photos could one day become evidence of their aggression. But paintings were different. They could be argued away as the figments of the artist's imagination. That was the reason the painter received a generous remuneration. However, the painter had not lost his humanity. His body and soul were tormented, and he felt both ashamed and pained, often hiding in the storeroom to weep. Once, Mal, who was responsible for cleaning the cages, accidentally stumbled upon him and kindly offered words of comfort. This act of kindness moved the painter. Mal did not hold a grudge against him, despite the inhumane acts of the Japanese army. The brilliance of humanity shone through in the steadfast and calm gaze of Mal. Unexpectedly, due to the inhuman experiments, such a kind-hearted Mal had become a monster. At the same time, Yoon was lost in thought with a portrait of Mal in her hands. She did not yet know that her mother Mal, whom she had been searching for for ten years, had already been experimented and transformed beyond recognition. Under the hazy moonlight, Yoon climbed over the low wall and sneaked into the Ishikawa residence. Since the guards were strict, she could not enter the main house and had to quietly observe from the rooftop. It turned out that Ishikawa and his wife Yukiko had been living in separate rooms for a long time, clearly not on good terms. As a lady of a reputable family, Yukiko also had significant power. She had handed a secret letter to her subordinates, which was then conveyed by her personal chauffeur who served her alone, pulling the servants to deliver the message. The next morning, Yoon and her father told Sang that they had uncovered some leads. After two days of investigation, they discovered that Myongja had no enemies. The only person who wanted her gone was Ishikawa's wife, Yukiko. So they interrogated her personal chauffeur overnight and learned that on the day of her disappearance, Myongja had indeed seen Yukiko and was then taken by the chauffeur to the hospital, after which she vanished without a trace. The trail ended there, as Ong Siong Hospital was known to only serve the high-ranking and noble. People from the lower classes would never be able to infiltrate it. If they wanted to continue the search for Myung Jia, it would have to be the rich man Sang to devise and arrange the next steps. Sang quickly made his way to a tavern without stopping. He brought with him a large sum of money for the owner, Jun, hoping to borrow his ID card. Jun's family was among the most prominent pro-Japanese nobility locally, and his ID card was the pass to enter the hospital. However, Jun loathed his pro-Japanese family to the core and had secretly joined the patriotic rebel force, always wanting to recruit Sang under his banner. Seizing the opportunity, he once again invited Sang to join, but Sang refused. Born during the Japanese occupation era, he was accustomed to surviving in the cracks of society. He thought, if the rulers of the state couldn't protect their country, why should ordinary citizens indulge in the fantasy of restoring independence? Jun did not press Sang and accepted the funds he donated to the independence cause. He lent his ID card without hesitation. As Sang left the tavern, he ran into Yoon face to face. As planned, she had changed into a western dress, stunningly beautiful and mesmerizing. Urged on by the housekeeper, the dazed Sang finally snapped back to reality. The group got into a luxury car and arrived at hospital's entrance. They used the ID card to deceive the soldiers guarding the door and successfully reached their destination. Inside, the housekeeper pretended to suddenly fall ill in the hospital lobby while Sang played along with the performance. This distraction caused people to surround them. Yoon took the opportunity to sneak into the records room to look for Myung Jia's medical files, but couldn't find them. Suddenly, a man appeared behind her to flex his large beard, causing Yoon to speak incoherently in her fright. Her father immediately pointed a gun at the bearded man, demanding to know who he was. The bearded man used his beard to shut up his smelly mouth tightly, only responding with a gesture that answered Yoon's father's query. 
Later, Sang and the housekeeper regrouped with father and daughter, learning that the bearded man was from the rebel force. The gesture of touching his heart with his fingers was a secret sign among the rebel comrades. The bearded man informed the group that prisoners taken to the punishment department were all sent to Ong Xiong Hospital, and none returned. There must be a secret base behind the hospital's back mountain. After hearing this, Yoon and her father decided to explore the hospital at night. They knew Sang was cautious about his life, so they told him to leave quickly. Sang stopped Yoon, reminding her of the great danger of this mission, and hoping she wouldn't throw her life away recklessly. But Yoon stated that when the cherry blossoms wither, it will be the day he perishes. The cherry blossoms are already in full bloom, and they might wither at any moment. They promise to find Myongja to save his life, and they will do whatever it takes. In exchange, Sang just needs to do his best to find the painter. Watching Yoon's retreating figure, Sang was sad. When he went after her, she was already out of sight. A doctor stopped Sang, intending to inspect his identity. Fortunately, a nurse intervened on his behalf, saving him from trouble. Just then, an alarm sounded, and the Japanese military began to evacuate all the patients. Sang and the housekeeper left the hospital with the crowd. It turns out the evacuation order was issued by Kato because the secret base behind the hospital was in chaos. The monster had attacked two soldiers guarding the gate. One of the soldiers was clearly still alive, but Kato ordered everyone to stand by and watch as the creature tore and tortured him. Unable to bear it, a soldier fired his gun, only to be impaled by the monster's GPS tentacle in an instant. Kato watched the cage with utmost devotion, calling the twisted and terrifying creature a deity. Meanwhile, the monster, with its massive body slammed against the iron gate, eager to devour more human flesh. Kato quickly ordered the spraying of nitrogen gas to sedate the monster before transferring it to a reinforced cage. During the transfer, all soldiers donned biohazard suits because the monster, after falling unconscious, triggered a self-defense mechanism, releasing a large amount of highly toxic spores from its body. The spore, like snowflakes, drifted into the cells. The prisoners, finding this quite strange, reached out to touch them. The spores instantly melted upon contact with body heat, and anyone who touched them suffered from their flesh decaying and ultimately died. The missing woman, Myong Jia, cowering in a corner, desperately avoided the spores, shaking uncontrollably in fear. At the same time, Yoon's father and the bearded man were hiding on the roof of the base, while Yoon lay on the eastern watchtower. She had the clearest view and saw the soldiers busily carrying out a pile of rotting bodies from the base. Concurrently, Sang was pacing back and forth at home, worried about Yoon's safety and regretting not taking the risk with her. The experienced maid noticed his lovesickness and scolded him for his indecision and lack of manliness. Since he was worried about Yoon, he should help her find the painter instead of pacing uselessly. Sang was jolted awake by the maid's scolding and dashed out the door, instructing the clumsy driver outside to relay a message to Ishikawa. Finding Myongja depended on locating the painter first. Using Ishikawa to find the painter was undoubtedly the most time and effort-saving method. In fact, Sang should have done this from the start, but he had only been focused on his own affairs, never truly considering the father-daughter duo's situation. The following morning, the hospital was indefinitely closed by the Japanese military, citing an outbreak of a deadly infectious disease. People were abuzz with rumors that several carts of decaying corpses had been carried out the night before. The errand boy, who had overheard the chatter among the crowd, hastily took the news back to the pawn shop. Sang was anxious and ready to go out to investigate for himself when he ran into the Japanese nurse who had come to his aid the day before. Without saying a word, she presented him with a strip of cloth that read, Myong Ja has been found. Sang was flooded with questions. He didn't know who the nurse was or why she would help convey a message. He was desperate to know if Yoon and the other two were still alive, and whether there was indeed an infectious disease in the hospital. Overwhelmed by his barrage of questions, the nurse broke down in tears and yelled she didn't know in Korean. It turned out she wasn't Japanese after all. Her patriotic gesture said it all, and her tears were not of panic, but of anger and grief. Despite having infiltrated the enemy's ranks, she had always been just a regular nurse, powerless to uncover the secrets of the hospital. Many rebels had infiltrated the base over time, but none had returned. She was aware of the hospital's bloodbath the previous night, fearing that the rebels might have met with no return. Staring blankly at the nurse, Sang clutched the cloth strip in his hand. After bidding his men at the pawn shop a calm goodbye, he left with determination. 
He knew he could have handed the lifesaver to Ishikawa and continued living a lavish life. However, he chose to enter the hospital himself, even if it meant risking his own life to save everyone. The Japanese military conducted human experiments at the Ong Seong Hospital in Korea, creating a biochemical monster with a craving for brain marrow. As the monster grew day by day, they had to sedate it with nitrogen gas and move it to a more secure cage. But as they entered the elevator, the monster awoke. Its long tentacles moved as fast as lightning, turning a human body into a honeycomb in the blink of an eye. A soldier tried to escape amidst the chaos, but the monster chased him like a GPS gadget out of the elevator. Amidst a pile of corpses and a sea of blood, a major with a bitten-off forearm regained consciousness from a brief shock. He ordered his subordinate to close the elevator doors. Unexpectedly, the noise drew the monster's attention, and its tentacle struck fiercely, coiling around the young soldier. Clinging desperately to the iron gates, the soldier pleaded with the major to save his shitty life. The Major clearly had a gun in his hand, and a single shot could sever the tentacle, but he refused to waste a bullet on a lowly soldier. Instead, he brutally smashed the soldier's head and closed the elevator door himself. After the incident, Colonel Cato visited the ward to see the injured Major. He showed no concern for the subordinate's injuries, and instead perversely inquired whether the monster was powerful and beautiful. He was eager to know the details of its bloodthirsty killings, because the monster was his own creation. To Kato, as long as the monster had the power to destroy the world, no matter how vicious or hideous it was, he would worship it with utmost devotion. For him, it was not a monster, but a man-made deity. When the director of Ong Siong Hospital learned that the monster had escaped its cage, he was not angry with Kato, but was instead ecstatic. At that time, Tokyo had already been bombed into ruins by the Americans, and the Japanese army was ready to meet its grave failure. The monster was not only fast and had incredible attack power, but it also possessed a strong self-healing ability. It was undoubtedly the most powerful weapon for fighting back. If they could tame the monster, they might be able to turn the tide of the war. Thus, the director completely sealed off the third basement level where the monster resided and fed it with fresh human flesh. Each time the monster fed, the director would ring a bell with a smile, hoping to domesticate it, so it would soon obey its master's commands. Meanwhile, Yoon, who was hiding inside the hospital, witnessed the Japanese army moving a large number of decaying corpses. A junior soldier with glasses couldn't help but vomit from disgust, only to be stepped on by the squad leader, who forced him to swallow back the filth he had just expelled. Yoon observed their lip movements, discovering that the junior soldier was actually a Korean-born soldier. She quietly followed him, saw him strip off the humiliating military uniform and attempt to leave this world cleanly. Yoon immediately intervened, telling him that dying in shame was meaningless. She then brought the junior soldier to the cleaning room and introduced him to her father and the bearded rebel disguised as a cleaner. They learned from the junior soldier that the Japanese army was conducting inhumane human experiments at the site. The hospital had been closed by the Japanese army and was guarded by heavy troops. Yoon and her father could not escape and had to hide in the cleaning room temporarily. On the other hand, Sang was planning a rescue for Yoon. He had obtained the hospital's floor plan and was preparing to sneak in before sunset. However, the mission was fraught with danger and he did not know if he could make it back alive. Therefore, he decided to meet with the Japanese painter first to inquire about the whereabouts of Yoon's mother. Unexpectedly, on his way to the appointment, he was targeted by a group of Japanese samurai. They knew that Sang had offended the chief of police, Ishikawa, and if he could not find Ishikawa's missing mistress within the specified time, he would lose his life. The samurai used their power to force Sang to hand over his pawn shop. When words failed, they drew their swords and inflicted numerous injuries on him. The noise attracted a patrol officer, but he was also Japanese and simply advised the samurai not to cause a fatality before coldly departing. The samurai looked at Sang triumphantly, shaming him for his dirty Korean blood. Sang could no longer tolerate it, grabbed the sword, and knocked out the samurai. At that moment, he wanted to kill him, but he could not afford to do so. On this land, the death of a Korean was a trivial matter, but the death of a Japanese would cause an uproar. He still had to meet the painter as planned and could not afford any more delays. However, when the battered Sang arrived at the tavern, the painter was already gone and the appointed time had long passed. After Sang returned to the pawn shop, the housekeeper and the maid were extremely concerned about his wounds. They urged him to rest for a while, reminding him that staying alive was of utmost importance. However, he was determined to rush to the hospital to save others. 
He explained to the maid, who was like a mother to him, that the Japanese had taken everything from Korea and were enslaving the people like animals. Yet he emphasized that humans are different from animals. They have dignity and the capacity to resist. June, a member of the rebel force, overheard this conversation at the door. Knowing that Sang had been searching for the painter, he intentionally brought him along. He had one request, asking him to head to the hospital to free the fellow patriots imprisoned at the base. It turns out the painter, although a Japanese, was different from the inhumane soldiers, and he was willing to risk his life to help with the rescue. As the painter was an appointed artist by the hospital's director, the rescue operation was greatly simplified. Without delay, Sang disguised himself as a rickshaw puller and charged into the hospital with the painter, while June hid in a secret compartment. But when they arrived at the cleaning room according to the intelligence, it was empty except for an ambiguous arrow on the wall. Meanwhile, Yoon and her father had reached the top floor of the base. Her father stayed behind to keep watch, while Yoon crawled through a vent into an underground secret base and jumped into a lab. Striking a match, Yoon broke into a cold sweat as she saw the room filled with glass jars containing various human organs and even the unborn. Retreating in shock, she was suddenly grabbed by a dirty hand, only to realize that a group of children was imprisoned there, soon to be turned into specimens by the deranged Japanese. Yoon couldn't ignore their plight and decided to first move the children into the ventilation duct. Just then, footsteps approached from outside. With no time to escape, Yoon hid in the shadows. A doctor came straight to the cage, and just as he was about to call for help in his chicken voice, Yoon silenced him with a knife to his chicken throat. Unable to deal with the body, she hurried the children along the duct and gently knocked on the vent. Unexpectedly, a group of Japanese soldiers outside were drinking and clearly heard Yoon's knocking. To protect his daughter, her father charged out. Speaking fluent Japanese, he managed to avoid immediate gunfire from the soldiers. Just then, fireworks exploded in the sky. Seizing the moment of distraction, her father grabbed a gun and took the highest-ranking soldier hostage. Amidst the sounds of fireworks, Yoon also emerged from the vent and engaged in a fierce battle with the soldiers. Suddenly, an enemy soldier shot her sexy body from behind without hormone mercy. Yoon thought she had lost her sexy life, but when she turned around, she saw the soldier fall to the ground instead. It's Sang who had arrived for her rescue. The red fireworks were stunningly beautiful, causing Yoon to be momentarily dazzled. She gazed at the man before her, etching his image into her heart, never to be forgotten in this lifetime. But her father spoke up to interrupt their smelly moment, reminding the two that he had knocked out all the injured soldiers and tied them up. They likely wouldn't wake up for a while, but for safety's sake, they still needed to move quickly. The safest place right now was only the painter's studio. As soon as the children entered the studio, they were startled by the sight of numerous anatomical drawings and cried out. Yoon was curious about his identity and upon asking, she discovered that he was the Japanese painter who had painted a portrait of her mother a year ago. Yoon quickly produced her mother's portrait, hoping the painter could tell her about the whereabouts of her mother, Mal. But the painter was stunned because the kind Mal had been turned into a biological monster by the Japanese army. He couldn't bear to tell Yoon the cruel truth and lied, saying he didn't recognize Mal and had only happened to draw her portrait, now unaware of her location. Upon hearing this, Yoon collapsed in tears, falling like a downpour. She had been desperately searching for her mother for ten years, and this portrait was the only clue. But now, even this last lead was gone. Sang watched all this, his eyes reddening with empathy. He wasn't born an orphan. He too once had a kind and loving mother. With this thought, Sang rushed to the children and draped his rickshaw puller's attire over an older boy, instructing him to have the courage to protect his younger siblings. Under the cover of night, a rickshaw charged towards the hospital gates. The boy pulling it focused on moving forward, life and death hanging in a moment. At that moment, a distinguished guest was visiting, and as the gates slowly opened, the boy charged out of the hospital. Once he was at a safe distance, he could no longer hold back his tears and cried. Following Sang's instructions, he went to the pawn shop. The maid, upon seeing Sang's handwritten letter, welcomed the boy inside and found two children hidden under a chair and two more concealed in a box of painting materials. The hospital's distinguished guest was none other than Yukiko. In fact, her family was of Japanese nobility, her status far above that of her husband, the police chief. Even the director had to stoop and respectfully receive her. Her visit was to ensure that the director kept a close watch on Myong Ja, the mistress carrying her husband's illegitimate child. She had to stay alive to give birth. 
Yukiko planned to use the child in Myong Jia's womb to take severe revenge on her unfaithful husband. She informed the director that Sang had likely already infiltrated the base and that Myong Jia must be moved immediately. At this very moment, Sang was discussing with Yoon and her father how to make their escape. The painter interjected to remind them that there was an exit through the water room on the base's lower level. To avoid suspicion, the painter had to say goodbye then, while the bearded man continued to disguise himself as a cleaner, staying behind to gather information. The others hurried to the rooftop and one by one jumped into the ventilation shaft. Upon seeing the bound soldiers, Jun suddenly stopped in his tracks. He harbored a deep-seated hatred for these invaders and drew his katana and killed them all. He did not notice the soldiers on the lookout tower had pinpointed their location. At a command, the soldiers all launched an assault, swarming into the base. Elsewhere, the monster was wandering underground. It curiously fiddled with a lever and unexpectedly learned how to use the elevator. A group of soldiers had just escorted Myongja to a single-person sick room on the second floor and were about to return to the first sublevel by elevator. But as they opened the elevator door, they were met face to face with the monster. It tore into them as if it were at a buffet, ripping apart human bodies with an efficiency. Meanwhile, Jun became separated from the main group, while Sang and the others reached the storage room of the base. After some struggles, Sang's wound reopened. It was only then that Yoon realized he had come to their rescue despite being injured himself, which both pained and touched her. Seeing Yoon's concern, her father suggested that the two stay on the safer second level while he went alone to scout the first level. However, shortly after splitting up, Sang encountered a soldier convulsing, his face turning blue, with a massive tentacle on his head. At the end of the tentacle was a rotting bio-monster. Sang was stunned by the sight, and as the monster drew closer, Yoon also heard the unusual sounds. She looked out and was so frightened that she nearly fainted. Little did she know that this hideous, bloodthirsty creature was her mother, whom she had searched for over many years. The bio-monster cornered Sang against the wall, and its tentacles struck fiercely, wanting to have a monstrous baby with the handsome Sang. Sang was unable to dodge in time and was stabbed in the arm. Seeing this, Yoon quickly fired at the monster, disorienting it. As the creature was preoccupied with expelling the bullets from its body, the two seized the opportunity to run for their lives. But after only a few steps, they ran straight into a soldier. The soldier thought he had caught a spy and was overjoyed, but before he could react, an angry roar sounded from behind. He turned just in time to be torn to shreds by the monster. Yoon and Sang rushed into the water room, just in the nick of time. The enraged monster was howling like a goose and slamming against the iron door, likely to break through soon. Fortunately, Yoon's father arrived, following the sounds. To rescue his daughter, he created a trap using alcohol and gunpowder. Then, drawing the monster's attention, he ignited the gunpowder, trapping it with a wall of fire in a dead end. At that moment, Sang and Yoon had found a ventilation shaft behind the boiler. Just as they were about to crawl in, they were surrounded by a squad of soldiers. With no other option, the two surrendered. On the other side, Jun sneaked into the prison and found two compatriots from the rebel force. But after only exchanging a few words, they were caught red-handed by the Japanese military. When the director learned that more rebel fighters had been captured, he hurried over to interrogate them. Upon seeing Jun, the director revealed a greedy smile and instructed his men to keep him alive. Jun's father was a pro-Japanese faction-wealthy businessman, and by holding his son's life in their hands, they could extort a hefty ransom. The jailer also learned of this get-rich-quick scheme and set his sights on the captured Sang, the owner of the local biggest pawn shop. Though Sang had no power, he surely had plenty of money. Thus, he took him into a room for a one-on-one -on -one chat. The jailer told Sang that his old home in Tokyo had been bombed to ruins, promising that if Sang paid a resettlement fee, he could walk out of the hospital unscathed. Sang agreed to his demand, but on the condition that three tasks must be completed first. The first task was to pass a message to the pawn shop, detailing the escape plan for the maid to assist from outside. The second task was to divert the prison guards. The third and most important task was to reveal the whereabouts of Yoon. At this time, Yoon was locked in a solitary cell. Because she refused to speak Japanese, she had been beaten by a sadistic sergeant. But no matter what, she would not bow to the invaders, enduring the punches and kicks. The soldiers cheered for the sergeant, finding the scene of a woman being beaten exhilarating. Only the junior soldier showed a look of pity. After the sergeant got tired of beating her, he took a closer look at Yoon's beautiful face and suddenly tore her clothes. Just then, Kato stopped the sergeant and took Yoon into the office. 
He stared into Yoon's eyes and recognized the familiar look of determination. He asked for her mother's name, and upon learning that Yoon was the daughter of the monster, Mal, Kato could hardly hide his elation. He discreetly placed the virus serum into a glass of water, tricking Yoon to drink it with sweet talk. But Yoon, aware of the malicious gleam in Kato's eyes, did not drink the water and was once again locked in the solitary cell. Turning her head, she saw two lines of blood on the wall, recognizing it's her mother's handwriting, which read she misses her daughter Yoon so much. Seeing that, Yoon suddenly collapsed. Tears gushed out from her eyes. As she touched the bloody characters, Yoon could imagine her mother's feelings. Her mother had endured ten long years in the hands of the Japanese military, holding on just to see her beloved daughter again. At the same time, Sang was taken back to his cell, where he joined Jun's two compatriots. They mocked him, saying that even the high-class owner of the pawn shop had become a prisoner. Sang ignored their taunts and looked at his watch before pulling out a key to the cell and unlocking the door. It turned out that the jailer had agreed to his conditions and must have already diverted the surrounding guards by now. Seeing the door open, the two compatriots changed their tune, humbly begging Sang to help them escape as well. Sang handed them the key and cautioned them to wait an hour before escaping. Using the information provided by the jailer, Sang made his way to the solitary cells. He distracted the guards with two pieces of caramel and struck quickly when they were unprepared, taking them down and seizing the keys. However, Yoon refused to leave. She said she couldn't abandon her mother and even if hell lay ahead, she would face it. But she couldn't bear to see Sang risk his life with her, so she hugged him tightly without a goodbye kiss, crying like a giant baby and begging him to leave the hospital quickly. Watching Yoon's retreating figure, Sang was reminded of his deceased mother. On a cold winter's night, his mother had frantically hidden young Sang in a cellar. She tearfully instructed him not to come out no matter what he heard, and from then on, to trust no one. Survival was paramount. As the cellar door closed, Sang heard the sound of hurried footsteps followed by the sickening noise of a nightstick breaking a skull. As a member of the rebel force, Sang's mother had preferred death over betraying her compatriots. Worrying her son would emerge upon hearing the noise, she did not scream even as she was beaten to death by Japanese soldiers. Sang carried his mother's last words in his heart as he struggled to survive in a chaotic world, accumulating funds through deception and eventually establishing the pawn shop from scratch. Everything he did was to live well, but after meeting Yoon, his life took a dramatic turn. He fell in love with this fearless woman and rediscovered the national pride he had lost many years ago. At that moment, he rushed towards the cells, determined to save all his compatriots. But to his surprise, the cells were empty. The rebel force had not trusted Sang and had already opened the cages and freed everyone. However, they had not gone far before they were blocked by several soldiers. Many were shot and fell into pools of blood. Sang arrived just in time, shooting the soldiers with precision. As he organized everyone's escape, a monster appeared. It flung the dying soldiers against the wall, their flesh tearing upon impact, the blood bursting from their uniforms like a cucumber splashed with chili oil. The monster then grabbed a rebel fighter, greedily consuming his juicy brain. Sang raised his gun, hoping his few remaining bullets would buy time for the others to escape. As the monster drew nearer, Sang realized there was no chance to retreat. In a moment of life and death, he spotted a canister of nitrogen on the ground. He struck the valve with the butt of his gun, and as the white gas spewed out, Sang covered his nose and ran fast like a Tesla bike. The monster collapsed, and deadly spores floated out of its body like snowflakes. Shortly after, the director stood raging impotently in the empty cell, seizing a jailer and giving him a brutal beating. He ordered the jailer to recapture all the Koreans or else he would slaughter his family. Meanwhile, Yoon aimed her gun at Kato, demanding to know the whereabouts of her mother. Kato, curious about Yoon's reaction to the truth, explained in detail the process of the human experiments, his tone growing excited, especially when recounting Mal's transformation into a brain-eating monster under the virus's influence. Yoon refused to believe it and decided to take Kato with her to see for herself. But as they stepped out of the office, she was confronted by a pair of soldiers and was captured once again. With a sinister plan, Kato chained Yoon in a large cage and moved the unconscious monster next door. From the upper level, Kato watched Yoon closely, not wanting to miss the expression on her face as he eagerly awaited the monster to devour her daughter. When the monster awoke, Kato ordered it into the large cage using nitrogen gas. The monster charged towards Yoon, extending its hunting tentacles. But at that moment, Yoon shouted, Mother! 
The monster froze. A vision of the young Yoon flashed in its mind. The maternal instinct overcame the biochemical virus as it looked at its beloved daughter with tenderness. Kato was shocked by the scene and ordered the killing of Yoon. Unexpectedly, the monster protected its daughter behind itself. Kato yelled to increase the firepower, and several machine guns fired simultaneously. To shield from the barrage of bullets, the monster transformed its terrifying tentacles into a protective shield, wrapping its daughter in its own flesh. A burst of nitrogen gas approached them, and knowing it would soon pass out, the monster broke the chains on Yoon and threw her heavy body to safety. Sang arrived just in time, pulling Yoon into the ventilation duct. The junior soldier had prepared the military uniforms for them, covering their escape to the infirmary to meet up with the main group. Right after, the jailer arrived with Myong Ja, hoping to escape the cannibalistic hospital with everyone else. At that moment, the police chief Ishikawa was sitting in the director's office, preparing to search the entire hospital under the pretext of investigating the disappearance of women and children. The director knew he was searching for his missing mistress and advised him not to waste his efforts, suggesting he take the police downstairs and leave. The director also revealed that the military has more power than the police and that he allowed Ishikawa into the hospital only because of his wife's face. In reality, Ishikawa had no intention of searching the hospital. Per Sang's plan, he only needed to delay the director because the housekeeper had disguised himself as a policeman, parking a police truck at the base of the hospital wall. On the stage, the group hurriedly tore bed sheets to create a rope with the fabric strips. They had only ten minutes to scale the rope into the truck. Suddenly, a soldier burst into the infirmary, and the junior soldier shot him dead, only later realizing the gunshot could have given away their position. Sang and Yoon quickly moved a hospital bed to create a barricade in the hallway, hoping to delay the soldiers temporarily. The junior soldier, wanting to atone for his mistake, stayed to fight alongside them but was unfortunately shot. With his dying breath, he handed over a keepsake, asking Yoon to deliver it to his mother. With little time left for escape, Sang took Yoon to a window and helped her to land safely. Then he threw the rope down, revealing his plan that one person must stay behind to delay the Japanese army, or none would escape. Sang let everyone go, volunteering to be the sacrifice. At this point, the ten-minute deadline was up. Ishikawa left the hospital with two trucks trailing behind. Inside one of the trucks, Yoon heard a barrage of gunfire sitting there with tears streaming down her face. Meanwhile, Sang took cover behind a barricade, firing desperately at the soldiers. Only after the trucks had safely left the hospital did he escape into the ventilation duct with the soldiers in hot pursuit. All exits were blocked, but soon they spotted Sang. Gunfire flickered in the dark tunnels. Fortuitously, Sang slipped and fell into a garbage chute, but at the bottom, he landed on a pile of human bones. The violent impact tore open his wounds, and he passed out from the pain. The truck stopped in the outskirts, where Myongja threw her pregnant body into Ishikawa's warm arms, gratefully cooing for her lover's rescue. However, Ishikawa, repulsed by her dirty and smelly state, pushed her heavy body away. Soon after he had rescued his mistress, Ishikawa ordered the recapture of all Koreans back to the hospital. But Sang had already anticipated his betrayal and had instructed the housekeeper to drive to the downtown street, where Jun's tavern was offering free drinks and merriment. A large group of inebriated Koreans had already surrounded the trucks, immobilizing them. The Japanese police struggled to clear the crowd, but to no avail, so they had to take a detour in their pursuit. But as they turned the steering wheel, they ran into a rickshaw procession and were blocked once again. By the time they caught up with the housekeeper, they found the truck bed empty. In fact, as soon as they were blocked by the crowd, the clothing store owner had given them clothes to change into, and the rickshaw procession was part of Sang's plan. Everyone had already left the capital in separate rickshaws. Meanwhile, Jun's father had donated a significant sum to the hospital, securing his only son's life. As Yoon and her father passed a cherry blossom tree, she remembered Sang's voice, saying when the cherry blossoms fall, that will be the day of his demise. Tears welled up in her eyes as she gripped the fallen petals, silently praying for Sang's safety. Chaos ensued at the hospital, with the director clueless about how to explain to Yukiko and jumping around frantically. Colonel Kato, holding an empty water cup, was lost in thought, wondering who might have drunk the water containing the virus serum. During that time, four people had entered his office. The jailer, Sang, Yoon, and Myong Ja. Sang now awoke among the corpses, staggering out of the garbage station, while Myong Ja, lying next to Ishikawa, was sweating profusely as a worm burrowed into her brain. 
The scene shifts to a silent night on the streets of Kyoto, where a woman in white wandered as if in a trance. Without a word, she approached the tavern owner, then suddenly leaped into the air, and in a mere moment, she twisted his neck, mercilessly devouring his tofu brain. It's revealed that the monstrous woman was actually Miyong Ja, the top courtesan of Kyoto, and also the mistress of the police chief Ishikawa. Her monstrous transformation into a brain-eating creature was all thanks to the machinations of Ishikawa's legitimate wife, Yukiko. Not long ago, Myung Ja, pregnant with the police chief's child, was sent by Yukiko to the hospital and locked away in a human experimentation facility where she was forced to drink water laced with a biochemical virus serum. Meanwhile, Yukiko herself arrived at the human experimentation base. As the behind-the-scenes benefactor of the facility and a noblewoman of one of Japan's most elite families, she was greeted with the utmost respect. Locked in a nearby cage was a biochemical monster covered in rotting flesh known as Mal, who was once human and, like Myung Ja, had been delivered to the facility by Yukiko. Observing the tragic state of the former acquaintance, Yukiko's eyes shone with excitement and greed. Just as she was about to leave, a crisis alarm sounded. The director warned of a Korean spy infiltrating the base and urged her to take refuge in the conference room. This Korean spy was none other than Sang. He was hiding in the shadows, watching everything unfold. As soon as the soldiers left, he stormed into the conference room and took Yukiko hostage. Because Sang was dressed in a Japanese military uniform and followed closely behind the highly esteemed Yukiko, he encountered no obstacles. However, he was severely injured and passed out as soon as he sat in the car. The driver hurriedly suggested that Yukiko dispose of him, but Yukiko, with a tender look in her eyes, extended her hand. Despite being married, she had long despised her philandering and incompetent husband. Over the years living in Korea, she had occasionally interacted with Sang. Although they called each other friends, she had fallen in love with him. Therefore, she took Sang to her home and nursed him back to health with great care for four days and nights. When Sang finally awoke from his coma, he was unaware of the many events that had unfolded during his absence. His loyal housekeeper had fallen into the hands of the Japanese. He was tortured mercilessly, with not a single piece of flesh intact on his body. Moreover, they hung him upside down and poured chili water into his mouth and nose. The Japanese police told the housekeeper that if he agreed to betray the pawn shop and accuse its owner Sang of being a spy for the rebel force, he could save his life. In reality, the housekeeper had long assumed Sang was dead in the hospital. To protect the honor of a man he believed perished, he had endured unimaginable torture. His steadfast loyalty was truly awe-inspiring. At this point, the pawn shop had been closed for four days. Yoon often sat at the entrance, waiting for Sang. Her father also believed that Sang had been killed and urged her to leave the capital as soon as possible. However, she tearfully revealed that she was unwilling to leave not only because of Sang, but also because of her mother, who had been turned into a biochemical monster by the Japanese army. It was only at that moment that her father realized that his wife was actually that monster. Unable to accept the reality, he locked himself in his room and wept bitterly like an old baby. Just as Yoon left, Sang, who had recovered from his injuries, returned to the pawn shop. Seeing him safe and sound, the maid had her eyes redden with emotion. In the past few days, many people had wanted to buy the pawn shop, but she had refused to agree, keeping the business for Sang. The most important thing now was to rescue the housekeeper. Later, Sang stormed into the police bureau, demanding that the police chief come out to meet him. Once in the office, he confidently requested Ishikawa to release the housekeeper and the merchants. Initially, Ishikawa had coerced Sang into saving his mistress Myongja with Sang's life hanging in the balance. Without the help of the housekeeper and the merchants, Myongja would probably still be locked up in the hospital. However, Ishikawa told Sang that he had only agreed to save his mistress, not expecting that Sang would also free a group of Korean prisoners. Now that the matter had escalated, he must convict a group of people. Otherwise, he couldn't explain himself to his superiors. Sang knew all too well that Ishikawa was a vindictive and petty man. He didn't want to waste any more time on empty talks of honor among thieves and expressed his willingness to pay a large sum of money to settle the matter. Ishikawa thought the deal was profitable, but still added one condition. He wanted to know exactly what had happened in the hospital. Soon after, the housekeeper and the neighbors were finally rescued, and Ishikawa received a note from Sang. 
It disclosed that the mastermind behind the human experiments at the hospital was none other than his wife, Yukiko. Ishikawa instructed his driver to continue surveillance on Sang and then hurried back home to confront his wife about what she had done to his mistress, Myongja. It turns out, since leaving the hospital, Myongja had become extremely afraid of sunlight and had killed the servants at home in a cruel manner, even hollowing out their brains. Yukiko, with her head held high in pride, reminded Ishikawa that he was not in a position to question her. After all, he had become the police chief by marrying into her family. Yukiko also needed a nominal husband to stay in Korea under the guise of military affiliation to work for her father. Since their marriage was based on mutual interests, it was necessary to abide by the spirit of the contract. Yukiko had made it clear from the beginning that while Ishikawa could indulge in affairs outside, it would be a different matter if he fathered illegitimate children. Such an act would only bring shame to her family. To protect family interests, Yukiko had intended to kill the mother and keep the child, continuing to control Ishikawa. However, she had not anticipated that Myongja would accidentally consume the biochemical serum, making the situation even more intriguing. After hearing all this, Ishikawa became furiously embarrassed. He knew Yukiko had taken care of Sang for four days and guessed her feelings for him. He deliberately mentioned that Sang already had a beloved woman named Yoon. Seeing Yukiko's heartbroken and jealous expression, Ishikawa felt a surge of spiteful pleasure. Meanwhile, Sang had a tearful reunion with Yoon, tightly embracing each other but without a kiss. Nearby, Ishikawa's driver kept a watchful eye. Suddenly, footsteps were heard behind them. Turning around, they were met with the sight of blood-soaked Myongja. The driver shot at her several times with his hormone gun, but she seemed immune to the pain and leapt onto him, viciously gouging out his eyes. Alerted by the noise, Sang and Yoon saved their kiss, rushed over and were stunned by what they saw. Myongja had become unrecognizable, driven by a primal hunting instinct, craving human brains just like Yoon's mother. However, Myongja had only received the first dose of the viral serum and needed the second dose within 24 hours to fully mutate into a monster. At this point, she was impervious to knives and guns. Her only fears were sunlight and fire. Sang used a torch to fend her off and shouted her name just as she was about to attack. This seemed to bring her back to her senses, and she remembered her humanity as a mistress and fled away with embarrassment. The injured driver seized the moment to fire a flare, which brought the police swarming from every direction. They quickly encircled Myongja. In a desperate bid to protect the child within her, she smashed through the glass behind her and took off towards the forest. When Sang and Yoon reached the forest following the sound of gunfire, they found Myongja surrounded by hundreds of Japanese police officers, with Ishikawa also present at the scene. He looked disdainfully at his mistress, who had been by his side through countless days and nights, now coldly demanding that she continue with the experiments. Myongja, holding on to one last hope, begged Ishikawa to save her unborn child. However, Ishikawa furiously denounced her as a monster, willing to abandon both Myongja and the child she carried. Disbelief struck Myongja as Ishikawa forced her into a metal cage. At that moment, she lost all hope. In a swift and ferocious move, she extended her claws and mangled Ishikawa. The policeman reacted by opening fire, riddling Myongja's body with bullets. Despite her bulletproof muscles and regenerative abilities, she needed time to recover. Seizing this moment of weakness, the police locked her in a cage and transported her back to the hospital for human experimentation. Yukiko was very satisfied with Kato's experimental results and promised to appoint him as the next director of the institute. She also issued a substantial grant for his research and encouraged him to capture more Koreans for experimentation to further improve the viral serum. In addition, she instructed him to properly tame Mal, hoping to one day become Mal's master herself. When Yoon returned home, she found no trace of her father, only a letter urging her to flee far away and forget everything. Alone, her father had come to the hospital, longing to see his wife one last time. At that moment, the wife he yearned for was feeding on the brains of the living. Recognizing the necklace on her, he felt both heartbroken and furious. Collapsing in a roar, his tears flowed uncontrollably. Kato looked down on Yoon's father with a smile, treating his sorrow as a joke. In truth, the cold-hearted Kato, devoid of human emotion, was more of a monster than Mal in her cage. He seemed to have been born without the capacity for human feeling, but what was most terrifying was his understanding of how to manipulate the emotions of others. He had already concocted a venomous plan to use Yoon to tame Mal. Elsewhere, Sang brought Ishikawa's driver back to the pawn shop for medical treatment. While his colleagues were all busy serving Ishikawa, only Sang saved his life. 
Remembering the years he had spent committing wrongdoings under Ishikawa's command, the driver felt deep shame. To comfort Yoon, Sang presented a cherished, lucky bracelet he had long kept. He hoped Yoon would no longer risk her life and expressed his willingness to give up everything to avenge her parents on her behalf. The two embraced passionately, still without a kiss, and before dawn, Sang left for his mission. Through his friend Jun's network, he successfully contacted the rebel group and acquired a large quantity of explosives, planning to infiltrate the hospital that very night to destroy the evil human experimentation facility. The previous night, Ishikawa had suffered unbearable pain due to a ruptured carotid artery. Yukiko coldly ordered the director to end her husband's pain with a dose of poison. She deliberately concealed the matter of Myong Ja and pinned Ishikawa's death on a Korean spy, posthumously bestowing upon her nominal husband the honor of his heroic sacrifice. As for herself, she naturally assumed the role of the widow of a righteous man. At that moment, the director came to Ishikawa's home to pay his respects in a pretentious manner. It was his last day in Korea, and he was presumably looking forward to a glorious retirement upon returning to his country. Unexpectedly, just as he settled into his car, Yoon appeared and shot him in the head with a single bullet. Yoon knew this was a one-way trip for her, but she had no regrets. She couldn't live with her hatred and refuse to move forward, nor could she stand by and watch Sang risk his life for her. When Sang arrived at the scene, there were only two pools of blood on the ground, with no trace of Yoon. The one-eyed driver pulled Sang aside and quietly told him that Yoon might still be alive. There was an invisible hand controlling everything. Sang guessed that the mastermind was the powerful Yukiko and that Yoon must be in her hands. What he didn't know was that the errand boy who had followed him for years was actually a spy. It was he who had betrayed Yoon's whereabouts to Yukiko. At that moment, he was on the phone demanding his reward from Yukiko's men. He was so anxious that he didn't notice the housekeeper standing right behind him, hearing everything clearly. As night fell, Yukiko paid a personal visit and bluntly told Sang that Yoon was dead. She warned him not to try to fight against Japan anymore. If he could stay quietly at the pawn shop, they could still be close friends. After saying this, she turned and left. Sang's eyes began to redden. He chased after her desperately and proclaimed that Yoon was his everything. Even if she was dead, he would find her body and seek revenge at any cost. Yukiko told Sang that if it weren't for her secret protection over the years, he would probably have been dead long ago. He was surrounded by trash with no morals, only seeking ways to survive. Beneath the grand facade of the pawn shop lay the foulest truth. She then revealed to Sang that the maid, who had grown up with Sang like a mother, was actually the culprit who killed his mother. Both were comrades in the rebel group, but the maid was captured first. Unable to withstand the torture, she wrote down the name of Sang's mother. The housekeeper had betrayed Sang to the police long ago, and the errand boy, to find the mother who had abandoned him in Japan, had been secretly monitoring the pawn shop. The most ridiculous was June, who had betrayed Sang and a group of rebel comrades without even being tortured. Sang immediately retorted to Yukiko, asking how she had the audacity to call the victims trash. It was clearly the Japanese invaders who imprisoned innocent people and tortured them with cruelty. Some people were tortured to death rather than betray their relatives and friends. They are indeed saints and heroes. Those who betrayed their comrades to save their own lives will carry a sense of guilt for the rest of their lives, living every moment in humiliating agony. Sang told Yukiko that enduring torture was more painful than death. The maid was a good friend of his mother, and his mother never blamed her until her death for betraying her. The thing he regretted most in his life was misjudging people, mistaking Yukiko for a kind person. Now that he knew her true colors, there was no need to be friends anymore. With a resolute turn, Sang saw the maid and the housekeeper in tears, and the errand boy was also hiding on the side, shaking with sobs. After Yukiko left, the errand boy returned to the pawn shop, sincerely apologized to Sang, and informed him that Yoon had been taken to the hospital by Yukiko. At that time, roaring sounds came from the hospital's underground. Mal broke out of the cage, ignoring the tasty soldiers nearby, and was determined to escape the base. Kato quickly ordered the elevator to shut down, trapping Mal on the third sub-level, not knowing where Mal was hiding. To force it to appear, he even ordered his men to push Yoon's father down as food for Mal. The man pretended to faint, fooling two soldiers and quickly subdued them. Soon after, Yoon was brought before Kato, and Mal, sensing her daughter's scent, paced under the iron netting. Kato was thrilled, ready to start his experiment on human nature. He wanted to know if Mal would bite off her husband's head first or suck out her daughter's brain. Yoon's eyes showed no fear, just a cold smile. 
She challenged Kato's brutality, causing him to furiously slap Yoon. Hearing her daughter insulted, Mal instantly broke through the iron net. Coincidentally, a massive explosion occurred outside the hospital at the same time. Sang took advantage of the chaos to climb over the wall and enter. Seeing Mal causing havoc, Kato quickly took Yoon hostage at gunpoint. To ensure her safety, Mal stood still amidst a barrage of bullets, while Kato hurriedly dragged Yoon away, desperately heading for the first floor. Sang had just climbed into the ventilation duct when he encountered Yoon's father. He pulled out a boat ticket for the next morning, urging Yoon and her father to leave first. He planned to take a large amount of explosives and perish with the soldiers. But Yoon's father snatched the explosives, entrusted Yoon to Sang, confessing he had been searching for his wife for ten years and could not bear to leave her at this time, hoping Sang could fulfill his wish. On the other side, bullets and nitrogen gas could no longer suppress the enraged Mal, which had already torn apart a large number of soldiers and was about to rush to the first floor. Kato ordered a group of men to escort Yoon away while he rushed back to his office against the clock. Just as he packed the virus serum into a suitcase, Mal appeared. Kato was so scared that his legs went weak and he smashed all the serum. In the moment of his grief and regret, he heard Myung Jia's cries for help. Elsewhere, Sang shoots and kills the soldiers after a fierce struggle and successfully rescues Yoon. Meanwhile, Yoon's father ignites a large amount of explosives in the lab. With tears streaming down his face, he hums the couple's love song. Mal, following the sound, enters the lab and stares at the tearful man before her. As she reminisces about the past, her husband passionately urges her to leave together. But as soon as the words leave his lips, the fuse burns to its end. A massive explosion destroys the sinister human experimentation base. Yoon tries to rush into the inferno to save her father, but Sang must tell her that her father has already sacrificed himself. Yoon is heartbroken, crying inconsolably. The painter, following the sound of crying, finds the two of them. While the Japanese soldiers are busy putting out the fire, he uses the chaos to lead them to a military truck. Sang, not wanting to endanger the painter, decides to part ways there. Uncertain of when they'll meet again, the painter hurriedly apologizes to them. He expresses remorse for the unforgivable sins his fellow people have committed on Korean soil and admits his guilt as a bystander. While Sang and Yoon cannot forgive on behalf of the victims, they still manage to bid each other to take care before leaving. The fire at the hospital grows more intense, and amid the ruins, a distinct trail of blood leads to the rooftop. Covered in wounds, Mal successfully locks onto her daughter's location in the crowd. As the explosion sounds, the maid packs the gold bars into a box, which the errand boy then bicycles to the port, intending to hand deliver them to Sang. Unexpectedly, as soon as the errand boy exits the gate, he is targeted by a group of men in black. As Yukiko arrives with a large number of kamikaze fighters, she tells Sang that Mal was once her teacher and the person she trusted most. She is devastated that Mal betrayed her and caused her to lose something very important. Yukiko declares that the traitor must pay with her life and that today is the day Sang and Yoon will join the afterlife. After pronouncing their death sentence, Yukiko elegantly departs. The kamikaze fighters draw their blades and Yoon goes on the offensive. Sang, with pistol in hand, shoots one by one, but there are too many and he cannot pull the trigger fast enough. He is stabbed viciously. With only one bullet left in the magazine, he chooses to save Yoon, shooting one of the fighters beside her. Before long, the blades graze their skin and blood soaks their clothes. Grievously wounded and unable to fight back, they fall to the ground. As the kamikaze fighters prepare to deliver the fatal blow, they are suddenly impaled by tentacles. Mal has arrived. The remaining fighters charge, but some are killed by the tentacles. Others are crushed underfoot, and the last is smashed against a torii gate with such force that his brain bursts into onion pieces. Seeing the ferocious creature, Sang quickly drags Yoon's sexy body away. Mal, thinking Sang is harming her daughter, extends her tentacles menacingly. Yoon pushes Sang away and is impaled by the tentacles. As she cries, she begs her mother to stop, telling her that Sang is the one she loves. In her dying moments, Yoon only says the cherry blossoms have withered. Before she can express her relief that he is still alive, she closes her eyes forever. When they first met, the streets were lined with blooming pink cherry blossoms. Yoon had promised to keep Sang alive until the cherry blossoms withered. She kept her promise, but like those fading blossoms, she left this world forever. After the fire at the hospital was extinguished, a soldier rushed in to find Kato sitting amidst a pool of blood, cradling a tiny baby. 
Not long before, he had cut open Myung Jia's stomach and removed the baby infected with the biochemical virus. Meanwhile, Yukiko held an elaborate funeral for her husband, Ishikawa, which was attended by most of the senior Japanese officers. Jun also came to pay his respects and handed Yukiko a letter from Sang, which contained just two words, farewell forever. A sense of foreboding surged in Yukiko's heart. She turned and saw many familiar names within the wreaths, names of the people who died at Ong Seong Hospital, including Patriots and Myong Ja and Mal, who had been turned into monsters. Yukiko hurriedly got up and walked out, but only a few steps away, the explosives detonated. In August of the same year, Japan surrendered unconditionally, and Korea was liberated. Ong Seong Hospital was closed permanently. Undeterred, Kato approached Yukiko to ask if she would return to Japan or continue to support human experimentation. Yukiko, severely burned and disfigured, did not answer Kato's question. Her ugly eyes brimmed with tears. It was unclear whether it was out of frustration or regret. Later, Sang would sit daily at the entrance of the pawn shop, always feeling as if Yoon had never left, believing she would return one day. It's then revealed that on the day Yoon died, Mal took her body and both mother and daughter plunged into the water. Mal gently caressed her daughter's face as a virus entity emerged from within her and entered Yoon's mouth, using its remarkable healing powers to bring Yoon back to life. Fast forward to the present day, a man who bears a striking resemblance to Sang opens the curtains. His appearance tells that he is possibly Sang's son. From that, it could be safely deduced that Yoon has finally returned to Sang's side, and together they have had descendants. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.